my name is Alicia Quinvex, and I'm a postdoc at Sandia National Labs, where I work on data compression and Trilinos. I believe you learned about Trilinos on Monday? You learned about Trilinos on Monday, cool. In this talk, I'll be providing an introduction to Git, and before we start, I feel it necessary to explain what we will and will not be learning in this talk. In this talk, you should learn what version control is and what repositories are. You'll learn about the difference between a workspace, a staging area, a local repository, and an upstream repository. And if you understand those four things, then you're good. You'll also learn how you record changes to your files in the repository. What this talk is not, uh, we are not going to cover every single git command because that's not a great use of anybody's time, but you will have a foundation that allows you to pick up the rest of git easily. We're also not going to debate whether git, SVN, Mercurial, or any other version control system is the best. We will learn about git in this talk, and a lot of what you learn will translate over to those other version control systems. Okay, so we're gonna start off uh, talking about what I did in grad school, my grad school workflow because as Catherine mentioned, it's way easier to criticize your own stuff than it is somebody else's. When I was in grad school, I worked on eigensolver code. And I used that eigensolver code on three different machines. They were called Lengso, Skolob, and Endeavor. Of course, that's what they were called because my advisor was a computational mathematician. If somebody else wanted a copy of my code, I gave them a tarball. And sometimes, because I like to back up my work, I would take that tarball and I would go and save it on Dropbox. What could possibly go wrong with my wonderful, amazing workflow? I actually want to hear from you guys. What could go wrong with my wonderful, amazing workflow? I heard laughter, but nobody wants to say anything. <laughs> Did I hear something from over here? What happens if Dropbox's servers fail? I mean, it might not be likely, but... <laughs> yeah, what happens if their servers fail? What about my side? Could anything fail on my side that would lead to me losing a bunch of stuff? I wasn't backing stuff on, up on Dropbox once a week. I was backing it up whenever I remembered to. And sometimes I would remember to, oh, once a year. What else could go wrong with my workflow? Yeah, let's say this. Uh, if, uh, for instance, you keep like, backing up like, tarballs, but after like, two months, you don't know what they mean. All of my tarballs are going to be out of date, and they're probably not documented. That's correct. If uh, the people I'm working with wanted an updated version of the code, it would be very difficult to give them an updated version of the code. I'd have to mail them more tarballs. Minus RF star. Oh, yeah. I've done better than that. I have done RF, uh, RM dash R slash star. And the people you're working with? Absolutely. Okay, so why this workflow is suboptimal? We already covered a lot of these. First of all, uh, something that we didn't really talk, talk about yet, but how do I make sure that this, my code is the same on all three machines that I'm using, Langso, Scolab, and Endeavor? I would uh, SCP files over when I remembered to, but sometimes I would not remember to do that, so I'm sure that the code I was using on, three of those, on those three different machines was not exactly the same. How do my colleagues get updates to the code? We talked about that. I was just emailing tarballs around, and I emailed dozens of tarballs around. If I were to break something or accidentally delete everything, rm-r slash star, if I were to accidentally break something, how would I get back to an unbroken state? It was really, really hard. And if my computer were to spontaneously catch fire, how much of my work would disappear forever? You guys laugh, but this is a thing that happened in grad school. <laughs> I had a computer, its name was Lanxos, and one day I came in and it was gone. It had spontaneously combusted overnight, and we never resolved what happened to it. But what I like to imagine is that because my computer was called Lanxos and I had it running a script overnight that was uh, running other eigensolvers that performed better, I like to imagine it got jealous. <laughs> and that's why it caught fire. So what could I have done differently? What would have dramatically improved my workflow that we are about to talk about? If I had used version control, that would have been so much better. I could have used distributed version control like Git. Version control is a category of software tools that help a software team manage changes to the source code over time. You keep track of every modification to the code in a special database called a repository. How would that have helped grad student Alicia? If I had broken my code, I could easily go back to an earlier version because it would be stored in the repository. And I'm not even talking about um, accidentally deleting everything here. I'm talking about doing things like, in grad school, I wrote in Fortran, and before that I had been a C++ developer. 
So one day I decided that all of the ones in my Fortran code should be zeros because I forgot that Fortran is one-based indexing. So I did that and I lost a bunch of work because I accidentally broke my code, had no idea how to get back to an unbroken state. Git would have helped with that. My colleagues would be able to get the latest updates to my code without even talking to me. I would not be an impediment to their workflow. And I could synchronize my work very easily across the three different machines. Also, because the distributed repository isn't stored on my machine, the risk of me losing absolutely everything to spontaneous combustion is much lower. And again, that's a thing that's happened in my life. That's a thing that I have to be concerned about now, spontaneous combustion of computers. So before we be, uh, begin talking about Git, I'm going to use an analogy about food photography, the best type of photography to help us understand Git. So the reason that I like food photography is it's so weird. The things that you photograph aren't usually the things that the food is supposed to be. Like if you see a picture of an ice cream sundae, that ice cream is usually mashed potatoes. So if you already know about Git, at least you have learned something hopefully about food photography in this talk. So the first step that you do in food photography is you prepare the stuff that you're photographing. And in this case, we are preparing our mashed potato ice cream on our kitchen counter. That place where you prepare the stuff, our kitchen counter, is called the workspace. After you do that, you put things in the staging area. The staging area is the well-lit spot with the backdrop that the camera's pointed at. And it's where you put things that are ready to be photographed. So note that in this shot here, in this, uh, oops, over in our staging area, we have some grapes, we have some cheese, we have what looks like a giant marshmallow that might also be cheese. I don't eat a lot of cheese, so I'm not sure. But what we do not have in that staging area is our mashed potato ice cream. We don't absolutely have to move everything over from the workspace to the staging area. We don't have to photograph everything at one time. And then after our staging area is ready, after we have everything that we want to take a picture of in the staging area, we take the picture and we stick it in our photo album. Note that the pictures in our photo album are in a linear order. Uh, imagine that I'm really, really obsessive about my photo album and I can't let there be blank spaces. So there are no empty slots except for at the very end of my album. The stuff that's in my workspace is irrelevant. We are still not photographing the uh, mashed potato ice cream. We are, we are not photographing the workspace. We are only going to photograph the staging area, but we will photograph that entire staging area. So back to Git. Our workflow is very similar. We make changes to the code. It's in the workspace. That was our kitchen counter. We move the desired changes to the staging area. That was where we had the camera pointed before. And then we take a snapshot, and that's actually what it's called in Git. It's called a snapshot, just like photography. And we put it in the repository. The things in the staging area are going to be part of the snapshot, and the things that are in the workspace will be left out. So let's make a repository. What am I gonna put in this repository? I, I did a tutorial about a month ago about Krelov solvers. So I'm gonna take the files from my Krelov solver tutorial and put them in a repository. So if we look at the files, I have a whole bunch of MATLAB scripts like gmresTest, jacobi.m, krelov.m, and they demonstrate various Krelov solver concepts like how does, uh, how does the restart value for gmres affect the convergence? How does the diagonal dominance of your matrix impact the convergence of Jacobi? So I have those files, and then I also have some images that were generated by them, they're PNGs. To create our Git repository, or to initialize our Git repository, we type git init. What that does is it creates an invisible directory in our current directory called .git. Um, by invisible, I mean if you type ls, you don't see it. If you type ls-a, you'll see it. That directory contains our local repository. Don't touch it. Don't ever directly modify your .git repository or your .git directory. You will modify it indirectly through git commands. So let's look at the state of our workspace and staging area. If we type git status to check the state of our workspace and staging area, we see that we are on the master branch. We won't talk about branches in this code, but we could have more than that. We are on the initial commit, which means that in our photo album, there are currently no pictures. There's nothing in our repository right now. And we have a whole bunch of untracked files that are listed here. An important thing to know about git is that git will try to help you. So it says, Right here, you aren't tracking these files right now, but if you want to track those files, if you want to add them to your staging area, type git add. So we're gonna do that.
But first, we should talk about what, what files we actually want to add to that staging area. So we had two types of files. We had the MATLAB scripts, and we had our image files. The MATLAB scripts are text, and the image files are binary. The image files were generated by my MATLAB scripts, and I can easily regenerate them. So we're only going to add the MATLAB files to the repository. Uh, special note, we can tell Git to ignore the PNG files forever, never ever bring them up again. Huh? Oh, I thought I heard something, sorry. We can tell Git to ignore the PNG files by modifying the .git ignore file. The best practices in Git are that if you have derivative content, you don't want to store that in your repository. So in this case, the image, the image files are uh, derivative content. The MATLAB files are original content. We can't regenerate those without me sitting down and typing a bunch. But the image files, all we have to do is run a script, we get the image files back. If you were writing C++ code instead of MATLAB, maybe your derivative content would be your .o files. You don't want to check those into the repository because you can regenerate them at any time. It's also a good idea not to store large binary files just because of how Git does compression. So now we're ready to add stuff to the staging area. To add files, Git already told us what to do. Git add star.m, that will add all of my MATLAB files in the current directory to our staging area. And if we type git status again to check our workspace and staging area, we see that we're still on the master branch, we're still on the initial commit, we still haven't added any pictures to our photo album. And these are the changes that are going to be committed. It also helpfully tells us if you don't mean to commit these things, if you didn't mean to put them in your staging area, you can type this to move them back to the workspace. So right now, before git add, where were my local changes? Were they being stored in the workspace? My local changes? Okay. Were they being stored in the staging area before git add? Or were they being stored in the local repository? Got a lot of quiet people today. I saw two hands. <laughs> you guys need a little more coffee. Okay, so before git add, all of our changes were recorded in the workspace. After I typed git add, where are my changes now? Are my changes still in the workspace? Are they in the staging area? Oh, thank you guys, thank you for participating. Are they in the local repository? My changes are now in the staging area. That is correct. Well, that's not where I want them to be. I want them to be in the repository. So how do I put them in the repository? We're going to type git commit to commit our changes to the local repository. So when we type git commit, again, git kind of holds our hand. It tells us, I need a commit message. And it asks you immediately to give it a commit message. What's a commit message? Um, a lot of you here might have never used like an actual physical non-digital camera. But back in the Polaroid days, we would take our pictures and we would write things on the back of them. We would say, uh, this picture was taken at Kiwanis Lake with Bob, Tommy, and John in 1968. I, I wasn't around in 1968, but, but if I were, I would write that on the back of my picture. And that's exactly what your git commit message is about, too. You write a message on your commit, on your photograph, saying exactly what you are photographing. So how to write a good commit message? You start off with a, with a general 50-character overview of what it is that you did. And then you can give more details. And usually you give maybe a couple sentences worth of details, but sometimes you can give more. These are two actual commit messages that I'm about to show you from Trilinos, from the software package I work on at Sandia. This is uh, the first commit message. T Petra, improve build time for a test. All of our commit messages in Trilinos start with uh, what package it is that somebody touched. This person touched T Petra. What did they do? They improved the build time for a test. Uh, it would probably be good if they mentioned in that commit message what test it was they improved the build time for, but it's really difficult to get that level of detail in your 50 characters. And then what I like about this commit message is that person goes on to detail um, what it was that they fixed, why was that done to begin with. And this happened because of an effort two years ago to let T Petra turn off global ordinal int support. That's why this error existed. And what I like about the fact that that uh, that this person mentioned that is in the future when somebody else makes that exact same mistake because it will happen again, they can go back to this commit message and see this is how to fix that exact mistake. Here's another commit message from Trilinos. Piro, adding back what was deleted. 
I didn't forget the rest of the commit message. That is the entire commit message. Piro, adding back what was deleted. What was deleted, I have no idea. Did they delete the copyright statement? Did they delete an entire file? What happened when they deleted it? Did it break the build? Um, no clue. So looking at that commit message, that commit message probably means something to the person who wrote it, but it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. I personally like writing my commit messages with the assumption that somebody, the person who's going to read it has never met me, will never ever talk to me in their lives, and I want that person to understand what it was that I was doing when I wrote the commit. So after we committed our latest changes, what is our state now? If we type git status, we see that we're still on the master branch and there is nothing to commit. The working directory is clean. What that means is we have nothing in our workspace and our staging area matches the last photograph that we took. If we type git log, that gives us information about our photo album or repository. It says that the latest commit was this hash, that's its name, it's a unique identifier. It was written by me, Alicia Klinvex, uh, last week on Wednesday, August 2nd. And then we see my commit message there. I added MATLAB scripts demonstrating pre-love methods, and then I go into detail about what those scripts do. If we'd had more commits, if we had more pictures in our photo album, this would uh, give us a list of all of the commits or pictures from newest to oldest. So after I type git commit, what have I touched? What have I changed now with that command? Did I change the workspace? Did I change the staging area? Or did I change the local repository? Awesome. Thank you more than two people for raising your hands. We touched the local repository. We now have this new commit in our local repository. So now let's talk about things that we can accidentally do on our systems that we don't mean to do. Yep? Uh, haven't you in some way like emptied the staging area or like? Yeah, I, I could have phrased that question a little better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, all right, all right. So your staging area, it, it's like you just took a picture and your picture now matches that staging area. Your, your directory is still the same as it was before. Um, things that I've done that are stupid. Oops, I accidentally removed a file. I accidentally removed krelov.m. How do we fix this thing? Git holds our hands. Again, it says that if we want to update what's going to be committed, if we want to update the staging area, we type git add or remove. If we want to discard the changes to the, to the working directory, we can type git checkout, and that will get rid of uh, the changes that I've made. So that's super helpful because that's exactly what I want to do. I want to check out an earlier version of that file. So if I type git checkout krelov.m, then what happens is we're still on the master branch and we see that there's nothing to commit, the working directory is clean. The version of krelov.m that I currently have in my working directory is, it's the same as the one that we last committed. Oops, I accidentally broke everything. I made modifications to jacobi.m and I accidentally broke jacobi.m. I don't know how I did that, it's like 10 lines of code, but I did. So once again, we type git status and it tells us to do the exact same thing to fix our issue. So if we type git checkout, jacobi.m, fixed. I have the earlier version of jacobi.m that I did not break. To review, the workspace is where you do your actual work. It was your kitchen counter where you were scooping the mashed potatoes and pretending that they were ice cream. It's where you were putting the, the baby powder on grapes and all of the other weird things that you do in food photography. Or in the case of code, it's where you were hacking on your C++ code. The staging area is where you prepare your commits. That's the area that you take the picture of. And the local repository is where the commits are stored. That was your photo album. In it was the command that creates a new local repository. Status tells you about the staged and unstaged changes. Add and remove, uh, those are the things that take things from the workspace and move them to and from the staging area. Commit moves changes from the staging area to the local repository. Log tells you about the commits to the local repository. It's your image of your photo album and check out undoes changes to your workspace. So which of grad school Alicia's problems have we solved so far? Can we now undo changes that broke things? If I accidentally rm slash rm dash r slash star, can I fix that? Well, I mean, technically that one I couldn't because I've deleted the repository too. But if I just remove things in my current directory without removing that repository, then yes, we fixed that problem. I can still find ways to break things. 
Can I easily share my updates with collaborators using my local Git repository? That'd still be pretty hard, right? Because it's still on my machine specifically. So no, we haven't solved that problem yet. Can I easily synchronize my work across the three different machines that I use? No, not really yet. Is my code protected from my computer spontaneously combusting? No, this, this repository is still sort of my computer. So right now we're going to talk about distributed Git. Important thing to remember when we talk about distributed Git, now there are multiple people touching the same distributed repository. So I'm up there, I am AM Clinv on my, my machine Starbuck because I was a big fan of Battlestar Galactica. And I have a workspace, a staging area, and a local repository. Somebody else is now going to help me with my code. Joy McClemens is going to help me with my code on her machine, Rose, which doesn't have nearly as cool a name as mine. And keep in mind that we might have different workspaces, staging areas, and local repositories on our two different machines. And also, those two local repositories, they're not necessarily identical to the upstream one. So to link your local repository to the one on GitHub, it is surprisingly easy because GitHub tells you the exact commands to do this. When you make a new repository on GitHub, GitHub tells you if you already have a repository, a local repository existing on your machine, here's how you link it to the one on GitHub. It tells you if you don't have an existing repository, here's how you make one. So what Git, GitHub told us to do was uh, git remote add origin github.com. This is the exact command. This is not a thing that you have to memorize. Git tells you to do this, or GitHub tells you to do this. And what that does is it links my local repository to the upstream repository. But there's nothing in it yet. So we're going to uh, update the upstream repository with my local changes by typing git push. And in general, you would only have to type git push, but because this is the first commit and the upstream repository doesn't have any branches yet, we have to git push dash u origin master. Again, this is a commit that, this is um, a command that GitHub gives you specifically. After we do that push, it asks for my GitHub username and password. I give it my GitHub username and password. It compresses all of my stuff and it sends it up to GitHub. And we see that we've created a new branch on the upstream repository called master. And now my local copy of master corresponds, it can touch the upstream copy of master. Oops, I made another mistake. I accidentally put some files in my repository that I didn't mean to track. Now how do I fix this? What I mean by this is when we, um, when we added all of my MATLAB files before, I had some files in that directory that were reading matrix market files and writing matrix market files. I don't use matrix market in any of these examples, so those files don't really need to be there. I should remove them from the repository. So if I type rm and I remove my local files, which of these areas did I change by removing those local files? Did I change my workspace? Did I change my staging area? Did I change my, up, my local repository? Did I change my upstream repository? You guys are good, we changed the workspace, and the workspace now reflects, if we type git status, it will tell us that we deleted these four files locally. Uh, my gmres.m, I have no idea why that was there to begin with. Rotemat, don't even know what that one is. It probably has to do with um, rotations for gmres. <clears throat> How do I update my staging area with this information now? Do I do git add or remove? Do I do git commit to update the staging area? Or do I do git push? The five people that raised their hands are correct. Thank you for representing. We type git add or remove to update the staging area. To update the local repository, do we do git add or remove? Well, we already said what that did and it doesn't do this. Do we do git commit to update the local repository? Or do we type git push? Git commit was the correct answer. And notice that, again, we're going newest to oldest. The newest one is going to be on top. So it's kind of like a stack. To update the upstream repository, we know it's not git add remove, we know it's not git commit, it's git push. Or at least that's what should have happened. It should have updated the upstream repository, but a funny thing happened when I tried to push instead. When I did git push, it asked for my username and password, I gave it my username and password. Um, and then it rejected my commit. It said, error, failed to push some references to github.com. The updates were rejected because the local contains work, because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. 
This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same ref. You may, first, you may want to first merge the remote changes by doing git pull before pushing again. Git's still holding our hand. That's what we want to do. But let's talk first about why this happened. So I have, um, on my machine, Starbuck, I have a workspace, a staging area, and a local repository. And when we started talking about distributed Git, I had one commit in my local repository. I pushed it to the upstream repository. And then somebody else touched the repository, the upstream one. Joy McClemens got a local copy by using git clone. And after she got her local copy, she did one of my plots needed a legend. One of my plots was not sufficiently pretty. So she added a legend to my MATLAB script. She used git add to move it to the staging area. She used git commit to add it to her local repository. And then she used git push to add it to the upstream repository. Meanwhile, I modified my copy. Uh, my local repository is not the same as hers. And it's also not the same as the upstream repository. So when I try to push the upstream, it gets confused about whether the remove file should come before or after I added the legend. The upstream repository had commits that my local repository didn't, so our histories are, are not the same, which means we need to update the local repository first before we do anything else. Um, Git's trying to merge the two linear histories, but it needs us to tell it how to order the differences. So what we're gonna do now, we're going to do git pull rebase. Git pull is the opposite of git push. Git push takes our local repository, sends it upstream. Git pull takes the upstream one, pulls it down to local. You don't necessarily have to use the rebase flag, but I really like using the rebase option because it tells Git to stick our changes on top of the upstream repository. So after we do um, git pull rebase, this is what our local repository looks like. And if we type git log, we see the same thing. Um, we have my initial, initial commit, which is where I added the MATLAB scripts. We have Joy McClemens's commit, where she added a legend to the Jacobi script. And then we have my commit where I remove files unrelated to the Krelov methods from my repository. And then when I try to push, that goes through because the upstream repository and I have the exact same history. So one last important note about removing stuff from a repository. I said that I removed those files from my repository but here's what actually happened when I did that uh, git rm. I took those files out of my staging area. I decided that I wanted to take another photo of my food, but this time without the giant stupid looking marshmallow. So I took the stupid looking marshmallow out of the staging area, I took a picture, and I added that to the photo album. That does not erase the giant stupid marshmallow from existence. It is still in the older pictures. So those files that I removed from my repository, those are still in the older commits. Uh, why is this important? If you accidentally committed something really, really, really bad, like let's say you had a file on your computer containing all of your passwords, which is a bad idea to begin with, but let's say you had that file on your computer containing all of your passwords for everything, and you accidentally added that to your repository, this will not remove it permanently from the repository. It will still be there in an older commit. Git purposely makes it hard to ever permanently erase anything, even though it is possible. Uh, but I just want to make sure that everybody here knows that if you accidentally commit something that definitely shouldn't be public knowledge, that is not how to get rid of it. Okay, so to review, the workspace was where we do our actual work. The staging area is where you prepare the commits. The local repository is where the commits are stored on your machine. And the upstream repository is the distributed location where the commits are stored. And it's frequently GitHub, although there are other places you can host it to. It could be GitLab, it could be somewhere else. I personally like GitLab because, uh, fun fact about GitLab, they will give you unlimited private repositories, which GitHub will not. We also learned eight Git commands. And if you wanna learn more about Git, here are some good tutorials online. The first one gives you a safe environment to try Git if you don't wanna try Git on your own machine. The second one uh, has all of the Git commands broken down in terms of whether they touch the, reposit uh, the local repository, the upstream repository, the workspace or the staging area, which I like. And then there are some more tutorials down there. I'd like to thank you for your attention now and take any questions you have with the note that uh, when Mike Carew gives his talk in a half hour, you're going to need a GitHub account. So if you could sign up for a GitHub account during the break, that would be really great. Hi. So isn't the uh, rebase option kind of problematic if you're going to be working with a bunch of people and maybe you have your 
one or two commits behind um, the upstream repo, you're kind of rewriting history? Um, that git pull rebase is different. Yeah, git pull rebase does something different than git rebase does. Um, git pull rebase, it, it changes my local history. Um, you might have noticed that when I did the git pull rebase, it changed this commit, the one where I removed the files. This one now has a different hash because it's a slightly different commit, but these ones are the same. It didn't change history. So you could rebase on, in both situations? Oh, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> Um, what it's doing is it's going to put your new commits on the top of whatever. It's going to do a pull first, then put your commits on top. And that's what you want sometimes. So you might have to come Yeah, there, there is a big debate as to whether rebase or merge is, is better, and I, I'm not interested in getting into that. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, one of the other big things is that you might have very large files and they're binary or, or whatever, I mean, especially in the climate world, we have mm -hmm. huge net CDF files. So obviously you don't want to have all of those just in your checkout process. So do you have any solutions to tracking something like that? Uh, Mike, do you have anything to say about large, large uh, binary files in repositories? Do we have any experience with that from Trinos? So, so there is support for large binary, large files, and I don't remember the model, but it, where it doesn't, maybe somebody else, do you know? Oh, get annex. You get annex, uh, yeah. But, yeah. It, but it's a separate module. It's yeah, separate. yeah. So there is, there, there is an attempt in the community to address exactly this issue. I don't remember the details. Well, let's say you have a NetCDF file and you change one value. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, can I? Sure. It's not the related answer, but um, first of all, thank you for your talk. I mean, we are a little bit sleepy because you know it has been very like, two weeks of stuff, so don't take it personal. I mean, <laughs> 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 yeah. You know, it's not like we don't want to raise our hands or anything. It's, it's just that we are. You know, uh, anyhow, so one thing I wanted to add is that I, I never had, like, many years I've been using Git, I never had an issue, but, like, two or three weeks ago, actually, we were talking about it yesterday, that I suddenly did, like, the status and the database was corrupted. So it's the first time it happened to me, and I didn't lose anything because I did a Git push, like, the day before, but it can happen. So even if you do, like, your Git comment locally and so on, if you don't do Git push, this thing can happen. So yeah. It's interesting. There's in Stack Overflow, there's actually uh, like a thread that has been pinned there because it, it, it's common that many people have this corruption thing. So just in case. Yeah, and I've certainly had that happen too. Even now that I'm at Sandia, and I use good software practices, sometimes I don't push frequently enough. Yeah. And then I lose things because I don't push. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a good point. Make sure to make sure that you always push occasionally because uh, as long as you're as long as your stuff is stored on your own personal machine, you are still vulnerable to the spontaneous combustion that plagues all of us. And definitely not just me. Uh, a comment and a question. I was going to say on the uh, Git Annex and LFS, they usually just hash the metadata of your files so that you, because you can't do delta encoding of uh, changes like an NCDF <coughs> file. The question I was going to ask was, is there any reason to use a non-distributed uh, VCS anymore, in your opinion, like SVN? Well, we did for a while at Sandia, and I don't know if you want to talk about why we did that. Um, so, so, yeah, we, I mean, we used CVS, actually, for a really long time on the Trilinos project. Uh, we never switched to Subversion because it didn't buy us any you know, superior model you know, for collaboration. And so when Git became an obvious choice for the next generation, we switched to that. And, and you know, the distributed aspect of Git wasn't a big deal in the beginning. We really used it like in a master-slave model for the beginning. But it's, it's become a, 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 an essential aspect of many of our workflows. The fact that two developers can work peer-to-peer -peer without being on the major branch. We have develop and master. 
that we work with regularly. We work with feature branches. So, and all of this stuff is not really feasible if you don't have a distributed source tool. So I, I think it's absolutely essential. I wouldn't see, maybe for a small team or you're just on your own, you could do, you do, do without it, but it's really a critical piece of it otherwise. So um, I use SVN still, and that's because I version even my private information. Um, not the sensitive one, but otherwise private information that I want to have access to everywhere. So uh, it's much easier to create a local repository on a server that you know is going to be backed up, and then you don't have to put it somewhere on a public space. So that's when things like SVN can still be useful. Can you talk about, like, sometimes when I'm reading the man pages and stuff, they talk about, like, index and working tree, and I, I, like, is, are those the same as any of those things, or are they, like, different, or I, index I've never, like, actually read any of the books, so, like, I sort of just glaze over it, but, I, I, yeah, I don't know if, like... Yeah, there are a lot of words for the same things. Um, the index is the staging area. 